Okay, good, good, healthy amount of 22s. How about the blue card? Okay, healthy number of blue card. How about the red card? Fair number, but more for the blue. Interesting. All right, well, let's, let's change this only slightly. In this case, uh, same kind of logic, but I'm going to say if, you're, if, you're, if the number is greater than 18, then you are drinking a beer. What cards do you want to flip over? If you're over 18, then you're drinking a beer. What cards do you want to flip over? You're going to check 15. Interesting. 22. OK. Anyone want to flip over the red one now? It is not an if or only if, which is a very good point. It's a very good point. So let's, let's go back to the, this, the blank example here. OK, so if the one side, so if it's an even number, then, uh, then, then it's blue, right? Then the other side is blue. All right, so the actual right answer here is you flip over the 22, and you flip over the red card. So all of you got the red card, very good. Most people don't get this right. Only 10% of people get this right. So it's, it's, not, it's not obvious. In fact, the first time that I saw this, I was an undergraduate. We had done a reading on this the night before, and then the professor gave us exactly this sequence. I had not done the reading the night before, and so I was the only one who put up my hand for the incorrect blue card, and everyone else put their hands up for the red one. So, um, yeah, don't, don't feel bad. It happens. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, what this is, is this is showing that you are, when you're thinking about this problem, you're actually not representing everything quite right. Because in order to check the, the truth of that statement, what you actually need to ascertain is whether on the other side of that red card there's an even number. Because if there's an even number, then it has to be blue. And that means you falsify the rule. We're not good at falsifying. And that's a weird little thing, right? So let's give another example. Are there more English words with the letter R in the first position or in the third position? Who thinks first? Who thinks third? Who's still thinking? <laughs> okay, fair enough. <laughs> too, too soon, too soon. All right, what do you think? I'll tell you what most people think. Most people think they're more, with the, uh, more in the first position. How many more do you think? Okay, I'll say, first of all, that's wrong. What do you think the ratio is? Do you think it's two to one, third to first? Do you think two to one, three to one, four to one, five to one, six? All right, I think we're guessing. But <laughs> the answer is four. The answer is four to one. Now, I doubt very many people would have come up with that naively. I certainly wouldn't. What words, what did you try to do to solve this problem? What did you do? You just tried to come up with words. Which ones were easier to do? First, right, you came up with more race car than airplane. Now, it was pointed out to me <laughs> that there are actually three words in here that have an R in the third position, more words and first. So you could have actually used even the question uh, to help you out here. But this is an example of, so, so you did much better than most people do, maybe because uh, you knew there was a trick. Um, <laughs> but let me just say that most people will not get this right. And it's because there's, uh, it, this is something called the availability heuristic, which means that you're making the judgment based on how easy or how many solutions you could find that fit the category with R in the first position and not uh, in the, the third position. Let's try one more. You meet a person who is bespectacled, slim, speaks well, and likes to read poetry. Is this person uh, an NUS professor of literature or a lorry driver? <laughs> what do you think? Okay, literature? Lorry driver? Who's lying? <laughs> Keep your hands up. <laughs> right. Okay, so first of all, again, how did you think of this? What did you do to answer that question? It's a ridiculous question, actually. But what did you do to come up with an answer? You imagined, 
and you thought of a stereotype, right? And what better fits the stereotype? Obviously, the, uh, in this case, the professor of literature. But there's an important thing that your brain left out. It left out how many lorry drivers there are versus how many professors of literature there are at NUS. Now, if you got the answer right, perhaps your brain did bring this into play, but most people would not. And they especially would not if they're in the context of a talk that's about their cognitive limitations. <laughs> so what this shows us, though, is that in this case, it wasn't that you can't think of these extra facts. It's that for some reason you don't think of them, right? It's not the case that you, you couldn't think of these other solutions or these other factors when that information was actually relevant to you. It's just that you don't naturally do that. So the take home point here is that our brains are often lazy. Just the way it is. Good to know. In fact, that's what I would say, is in this case, knowledge really is power. Because once you know about some of these propensities for what you do with your reasoning, you can do something about it. Now I'll say sometimes, because it's still hard. It will still take you much more effort to actually reason through some of these problems with all of the information than it will be just to come to that snap judgment. Your initial reaction will still be to think of a bespectacled, slim person as an NUS professor and not as a lorry driver. So, ah, sorry, didn't mean to flash it up there quite yet. Um, so the question then is, okay, Chris, who cares, <laughs> right? Who cares if I can't, uh, if, I, if I don't think of a lot of words that have an R in the third position? Who cares if I think that, uh, uh, that I have trouble with discerning who's a lorry driver? Um, or for that matter, who cares about a card task? I'm never going to have to do that. All true. But you probably care about things like stereotypes. You probably care about how you make decisions or how you think about things like crime rates. Right? What do you do? You think of what's in the news. And if what's in the news is a lot of homicides, you might think that homicide rates are very high. They're not. They've gone down almost everywhere, um, certainly in, in, in the first world. Uh, and this is in the United States. You can see that it's gone down quite a bit. But prison imprisonment has gone up. And the total crime misery index, which is a fascinating term, uh, just how concerned people are and how much they feel that crime is affecting them, that is a lot higher. So perception is, is, is definitely a part there. But if you want to make good decisions about that, if you want to perceive the world um, in this sense in a more veridical way, then it's good to know about these kinds of biases. Um, think about other kinds of big decisions that you have to make uh, in, in which you actually want to have all of the information there, but you know that your brain's going to play some tricks on you. Something like, I don't know, uh, where you want to go to college. Not that I have any opinions on this. Um, <laughs> But let's say that that's an important decision, right? And there are lots of factors that come into play, and it's difficult to, to make that decision in kind of a, in a clear way. And it's not obvious to us what goes into that decision, but what I can tell you is you're probably leaving out some things that are rather important. So do your best to go uh, think through those. And if you want a homework assignment of, of kind of how to think a little bit better about these kinds of things, I highly recommend Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, I'd imagine a lot of you have read it, um, in which case that diminished the power of these examples, but that's great because it means that you actually can get around some of these problems that uh, most of these examples, people get them right in the order of anywhere from 0% to about 10%. You were doing better than all of them, and I don't think it's just because of context. So let me go through the, the main points I had. One, we face cognitive trade-offs. There are a lot of questions, though, about uh, about this topic. So why are some people more distractible than others? Uh, are there certain groups of people who are more distractible? Are you more distractible when you're sleep deprived? All of these kinds of questions that can still be answered. Novelty is powerful. What makes something new? I mean, advertisers know that novelty is powerful. That's why they use new things when they're trying to get you to buy a product. But what is it exactly that makes something new to your brain? Third, get more sleep. I've already said that. <laughs> But, to contradict myself for a moment, there are interesting drugs that seem to reduce at least your effects of sleep. You know of one, probably a lot of you had caffeine. That has some side effects, as you probably know. 
but it's not clear what the long-term effects are on your brain are. And there are other drugs that seem to have fewer of those side effects that, say, caffeine does, something like modafinil. What are the long-term effects? No one really knows. But for now, get more sleep. <laughs> Our brains are often lazy, and uh, the correlate knowledge is power. There's a lot to be studied here with exactly how much instruction can help you get around some of these, these limitations of your brain, whether that's training, whether that's getting more practice either with multitasking or with being in distracting situations, or whether that's something about reasoning through a problem. So with that, uh, let me just thank you all again for your sustained attention during the talk. And I'll just uh, thank all of my collaborators on these various projects, and again, you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for the wonderful and thought-provoking uh, talk. Uh, you know, I was really paying attention. My cognitive ability was at the max during our talk until you showed a picture on Tiger Beer, and I'm totally sleep deprived now. <laughs> <laughs> We'll do this session uh, slightly different. We'll have the Q&A right now instead of having a combined session later. So the floor is open for questions. Well, while people warm, maybe I'll just start the ball rolling. Okay. Now does... Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay. We have a question right okay. as well. Sorry, Professor. Uh, just now, I have one question. That, that it is that. Uh, do you think that the, just now the example you pay, make people make misjudgment is because of the cognitive problem? Is because of cognitive problems or the way they interpret the problems? So, so which the, the the card selection task you mean? Uh, say the, the 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 literature professor problems mm -hmm. because. Uh, um, I, I don't want to talk about too much about mathematics, but there are two ways of, to, uh, of looking at the probability here. One is the, the typical prob probabilistic view. One is the Bayesian view. And these two views are, are usually contradicted to each other. One, because, one, uh, because the Bayesian view takes part into the, the, the so-called prior uh, uh, probability. And uh, the, 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 the classical um, classical probability view don't take in the prob prior probability into consideration. So that these, if we take these two different views to do the calculations, then our, our results will be drastically different. True. And the, the one of them will support that it is lit, the, the professor, one of the other one will, will think is a lorry driver. Right. So do you think that it is the, the, the people's mindset or or I said the paradigms in our brains do, will affect this kind of decision. So in this case, there is only one right answer in that, as far as the actual probabilities being calculated here, and that is to take the base rates into consideration. So that would be the Bayesian approach. Um, what it, it seems like people's brains are not doing that. Uh, is that a problem of the language of interpretation? Perhaps. Uh, the thing is, even if you explicitly ask people you don't give them, as I say, kind of a, a nonsensical question of, is this person this or this? You ask them the likelihood uh, whether this person is this or this. Given just that description, they'll still make the same error, which means that they're not taking that base uh, rate into account. If you actually give them that information, they often will take that into account, although people are not particularly good Bayesian computers, uh, so they might not take it into account fully properly. One other thing that's interesting is that if you distract people whilst you're giving them that information, they will revert to the, uh, the simpler calculation of not taking those base rates into consideration. Yeah, sorry, one thing is about the Bayesian method is that because we lack of the information of the not, we know that there are a lot of uh, US literature professors which like to read poems and slim and wear mm -hmm. spectacles, but we <laughs> don't know how many of them who ah, don't read any poems. We don't have this kind of information, so actually, our calculation is, is, is somehow stuck. We have to assume a number which, which have no, no basis at all. That's true. What's interesting is that we do make an assumption. And the assumption goes in the direction of, no, there aren't people who are like that, or there are not lorry drivers who fit that description, which is, of course, an assumption uh, in itself. There are better 